Hey babes, it's Kayla Craft with the Mommy Millionaire Podcast. I'm a mom of three littles, ER nurse turned self-made millionaire and lifestyle entrepreneur. I am bringing you inspiring stories, business and mindset tips to help you be shameless in pursuing your ambitions. Hey, Mommy Millionaires. Today's going to be a special episode because I'm bringing on a special guest and it's a returning guest. You guys will have to start guessing who it is. And I want to remind you guys that I think we're just a couple, we're four months out from Mommy Millionaire Live. And I think we're halfway sold out at this point. You guys have got to grab your tickets. It's going to be awesome. So head over to mommymillionaire.co and check it out. Also up on mommymillionaire.co, I have this awesome free resource called the Mommy Millionaire uh, Law of Attraction ebook. And it's all about how to gain more customers by just being you. So download that if you haven't. It's completely free and awesome. So let's get into today's episode. It's going to be pretty conversational because it's with my one and only husband, Chase Craft. Welcome to the show. Hey, hey. Glad to be on. This is going to be fun. <laughs> I, I got to tell you guys, like, as you guys are listening in, we just got in a fight. It was not even a real fight, but he's eating tuna. And <laughs> right before we started, he did like a semi like silent burp and he thought it wasn't going to be, he thought it wasn't going to be stinky. And I literally almost <laughs> lost it on him. Like how awful is the smell of tuna? First of all, like it's horrible. But it and tastes then, good. Yeah. Yep. It tastes good. But anyways, he apologized. This is marriage. This is marriage <laughs> for everyone else out there that's not married. This is marriage. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. Okay. And then he just smiles, his little smile is oh, okay. And so I'm not mad anymore. But <laughs> let's chat. Now We're, I'm very self-conscious about my tune the breath. Really? You're self-conscious in front of me? <laughs> oh man. Okay. So we're talking all things life. So I thought it would be fun if Chase just interviewed me for a couple minutes and asked me things so you guys could get to know me a little bit more on a like normal side, not a business side, <laughs> not a coaching side. And Chase and I have been together for 12 years. Yeah, we've been together for 12 years, married for 11 years in August. Yep. So, whoop, whoop. And she robbed the cradle, just in case anybody didn't know that out there. Okay, you're two years younger than me, dude. Like, yeah, but when we met, I was 17 and you were 19. <laughs> you were, That's a big deal when you're in high school. It is. Okay, first of all, okay, you were in high school. You just graduated. Uh, the day before we met, I graduated. So okay, so that counts. I was pretty much still in high school. Yeah, I didn't want to date you. My mom was like, you better not let him get away. <laughs> now, see, you need to thank my mom instead of be mean to my mom. So ask me so, questions. back to... I was 19, or no, well, I was 19 when we got married. Those of you who don't know that. You keep on, nobody knows that. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, there you go. I was 19 when we got married and Kayla was 21. Did you tell them how you proposed to me? Because it was really sweet. No, I didn't. You were just here listening to the same episode <laughs> that I'm <laughs> recording. Um, so I guess she wants me to tell my, our engagement story. Well, yeah, everybody wants to know because oh. it was cute. Despite all of the months of Kayla not wanting me to surprise her with an engagement, <laughs> she was like a hound dog, dude, every single day wanted to know if I was going to propose that day or not. <laughs> well, well, we had already picked out a ring. Yeah. Like we had already coming. gone and yeah. I picked out the ring. So I already knew we were getting engaged. I was still 18 at this point. Yeah. You were 18. You were definitely 18. <laughs> you were making how much, how much an hour? I was working as a sandblaster making, uh, I don't remember how much I was making 12 bucks an hour. Yeah. 12 bucks an hour. That's minimum <laughs> wage now, people. Yeah. He was, you know, he was making big bucks back then. No, I was making 11. I was making eleven dollars an hour because that's what I started at. And I was in nursing school. Yep. And that was when I was in nursing school. That's when I worked at the hospital. I would go in at five a.m. Well, four thirty a.m. 
and I would staff the hospitals. And I made, I think it was, I think I made 17 bucks an hour. I was doing pretty good. We were living high. You know? Hey, you know what though? I was still living at home and I was just socking away. Every, oh, yeah. all the cash that I was making, I was just socking it away. So it was all right. <laughs> and I got, I mean, I, I, I You'd always come, go to dinner with your parents. So they'd buy us yeah. dinner. <laughs> we know how to play the system. We were playing it. That's all right. Uh, so man, I, that went on a weird tangent. Uh, well, people all probably are taking back to when they were dating their husbands yeah. or something, or maybe yeah. they're not even dating anybody right now. There's hope if you aren't. <laughs> are, are we going to be a dating podcast right now and give people like, we would be the worst I don't even people. Know where that came from. We would be the worst people to take <laughs> dating advice from. <laughs> and we got married when I was 19. Yeah. Like hound that. them until they pay attention to you. <laughs> <laughs> Stay on them until they put that ring on it. (laughs) Okay. You're getting, you're taking, getting the mic taken away. It was not like that. It was a beautiful day, January 12th, 2007, when he proposed to me. And it was, you guys, it was so beautiful. It was, it was back in the day before it was cool to have everybody watch your engagement. And I think he started the trend Yep. and he had all of our families hiding in the dunes at Pismo beach. And we were riding horses at sunset um, on the beach. And then all of a sudden we were like, you know, walking along the ocean and he was like, okay, let's get off here. And I was like, why? <laughs> why? He was like, come on, let's, there's something up Kayla, here. Being the type A personality wanted to control the situation <laughs> at all times. <laughs> yeah. And then, so we walk up to the dunes and I'm like, by that point, I'm like, okay, something's happening here. Cause this is really weird. And the horse lady that was like with us was like, I'm gonna, I just want to get a picture of you guys. And I was like, yeah, right. And then all of a sudden he gets down on one knee and asked me to marry him. And then we had, he had a photographer there that caught the whole thing. We need to find those photos. All the family. Then we went for pizza afterwards. That was, <laughs> that was, that was back in the day when Kayla ate pizza. Yeah. Like that was when I got down. That was when we'd go to Taco Bell. We'd go, we'd get down. Jack in the box, curly fries. I ranch. still get down. <laughs> Okay. Ask me some questions. All right. So we just launched our millionaire society membership, which was wild and crazy roller coaster, but great all in the same thing. So in light of the last week in this last launch, what did, what was the most important thing that you learned from this last week in our launch? Oh, oh gosh. The most important thing I think is to be unattached to the outcome. And every time we launch something or like I make a goal, it's always like wildly unrealistic. And I still somehow think even if the numbers don't line up and, and my whole team is telling me, Kayla, there's no way that's going to happen. I still somehow magically believe that it will. I'm like really good at like keeping the hope until, <laughs> until there's literally no hope. And, uh, what, and I think the thing that I learned was that by like day five or whatever, I was like, okay, like I'm, I'm completely, I'm, I'm releasing the number. I'm giving up on that specific number because it was bringing me so much like anxiety about it. And so like, then the last two days of the launch, I was just like, it is what it is. Like, you know, I'm going to run the race. I'm going to finish it with perseverance. I'm going to go hard. And then I'm just going to focus on everybody in the society, like literally having the time of their lives and like their whole lives being transformed. And that's what I, I felt such good energy waking up this morning, seeing the numbers They we didn't hit our goal, but still it's like a lot of people that said yes to changing their lives with me. And I was like, that's what matters. Like, even if it was just one person, it would still matter because, um, that's the whole reason why I'm doing it, you know? And so I just, I really feel like I learned that to, to release the attachment to it because I used to look at it. Like if I didn't hit a goal, especially like in my network marketing business, I always attached it to like my self-worth and was like, okay, if I didn't do that, I'm not good enough. And I would just go down a rabbit hole of not feeling good about myself. And now I know that literally it has nothing to do with me. Like I'm doing all the work on me. I'm working on myself every day. There's a lot of things I don't know. And, um, but the one thing I do know is like when it gets to numbers like this, when you're playing, when when you're like 
playing in the big leagues right now, like it's all a numbers game, like in how much money you're willing to spend in ads. And so that's where I was like, whatever, like it is what it is. I'm just going to focus on loving people. So I feel like I felt good. I really feel good. Like my self-worth today wasn't attacked at all. Like I was just like, I felt so loved by like all the people in the group. I just felt so honored. Like, oh my gosh, like I cannot believe, like I'm just, I'm so excited to see their lives transform. Like seriously, like so excited. And one thing that I have noticed too is your personal growth in this is that you, even though we don't hit, you know, we didn't hit the number, you know, you you tend to have skyrocket goals, which is super awesome because you're, you are the visionary. You're the one that's pushing that energy behind our team. And, you know, so thankful for our team. Our team is literally amazing. And, we, we just implement, you know, like you bring the energy, you bring the vision, we implement, like you, you have a huge goal. We're like, okay, like the numbers don't work out, but you know what, we're going to, we're going to, you know, put our best foot forward and see if we can make this happen. But the thing that I love about you is you, you set these huge goals. And even if we don't hit them, it doesn't, you don't get depressed. Like you, you, to the last minute, you're still, like saying that we're going to hit this goal and we're like going, uh, okay. And, you know, it's like, we got an hour left and you know, we're not even close, which is, you know, but then as soon as it closes, you're like, oh my gosh, I'm so grateful. You know, I'm like, I'm so grateful that people trust in us and they are willing to, to spend their hard earned money to trust in us to help them take them to the next level. And you're just like, that just proves, it just goes to show like how much work that you've done. Because like you said before, and like our network marketing because if we didn't hit a goal, like it would, it would really affect you and your energy for, you know, a couple of days. Yeah. I would be like in the fetal position, just like completely depressed. Yeah. But yeah, yeah, you just, I just have seen that in you, um, especially over the last couple of years, especially since we've started this mommy millionaire brand and, and you've gotten to just see how much work and time goes into it. And, you know, just the fact that anyone is willing to trust us to grow, you know, help grow their business or change their mindset or whatever is just, we're just so grateful. It's just, and I think for those of you guys listening in, so this is just, cause you know, I always have to bring it around to it being a teaching moment is, um, I know a lot of you guys set your goals. It could be anything. It could be a relationship goal, a life goal, a career goal, a mindset goal. And sometimes you, you don't hit your goal, you know, and the amount of time that you wanted to do it. And I think don't change the goal just because you don't hit it you know, in your time frame, you have to be flexible about how to make it happen. And like, that's one thing that I've realized is like, you have to release, like, it's good to have a time date on it, right? Like I'm going to do this by this date, but if it doesn't happen, it's like, you've still set it out there to the world that you're going to do it and keep taking actions every single day that are going to get you closer to it. And like, looking back now, it's like, I already know the number one thing of why we didn't hit our goal. Like it was plain and simple. We didn't have the audience. Yep. To hit the goal. Um, because for those of you guys that are listening in right now, like your email list, you have to usually, and this is just an average industry wide percentage, six percent of your email list will convert to buyers. Yep. And that's actually a good percentage, right? I mean, six percent is a as a high. Yeah. Right. I mean, so so just know that. Like if you're trying to like launch anything and you have a list of a hundred, no six percent normally. So that would mean six people, right? So really, I cannot hammer in enough, get your email list going. If you haven't yet, like what the heck are you doing? Even in my marketing mastery group, like so many other girls in there are like resistant to doing it still. I'm like, oh my gosh, (laughs) it matters. It's seriously the only thing that matters. Like I look, I have 104,000 followers on Instagram right now. And, um, you know, we had, what was it? Three over a little over 300 people in, enroll in the society. Yeah. That was $37 a month, which I thought would be a no brainer for people. Right. So, um, you can't look at your following as your list. You have to look at your email list as your list. Yep. So, yeah. So that's, um, I mean, for those of you guys, it's just like learning to, you know, still stick with your goal, but like be okay that it's going to happen in your timing. Yeah. Because I think of it like God gives you what you can handle. And maybe if we would have been given more than, you know, 
you know, if we would have, I wanted a thousand people, that was my goal. And so if we would have hit the 1000, maybe we wouldn't have had the capacity to deal with that right now because Mm -hmm. we would have had to probably hire more people. So it's, I mean, you know, I just feel like we got what we, we could handle right now. Yep. So, and I'm really excited. (laughs) I think just practicing, you know, like I said, practicing gratitude and then, and then taking everything as a learning experience. Like, so, so me and the team now, we go, okay, we didn't hit our goal. Like, let's, let's look at every metric that we can possibly look at. Um, and now we have, now we have something good to gauge like next time. So if, you know, like Kayla says, if we had 6% of our email list buy, then now we know if we want to hit a thousand people, then we need, you know, to, to increase our email list by a lot. (laughs) So, so it's just, you know, taking every opportunity, even though if you didn't hit your goal, like not to get down on yourself, just know that like it's, it's just a learning experience and that you, every, every entrepreneur is gonna, gonna fall before they can run, you know? Mm-hmm. Totally. I feel like we've had so many failures, <laughs> yep. but yeah. But we're failing forward mm-hmm. and that's the important thing. We don't, you know, we don't get down on ourselves. We don't quit. You know, we, we keep our energy high and we continue to practice gratitude in every. Yeah. The people that lose are the people that quit. Yep. Cause everybody eventually wins when you just keep going because you, then you figure it out. You're like, okay, this doesn't work. This doesn't work. This doesn't work. I'm finally going to find the thing that works. Yep. You know? And I think most people just, they quit after several times. Yep. Another question. Yeah. Um, I think people want to learn some more personal things about you. Ask me. So what is your favorite thing to do outside of kids, outside of marriage, work? Like it, like if you were to do one thing that brings you the most joy, what's, what is it? Can it be soul cycle? <laughs> <laughs> or is that still considered working? <laughs> yeah. this kind of considered work, I guess, working out. No, I want to like, like what, yeah. What is it that you, that brings you the most joy? Yeah. I really like, like, I love, I used to not be like that, but I feel like right now I just have such a good group of girlfriends that like I, any chance we get, we're hanging out. Like today we were all going to lunch together and I couldn't go because my pink eye. (laughs) Well, I don't know if it's pink eye, whatever. Um, anyway, so, you know what I mean? Like I look forward to those times. Those are like things I just love. I love girl talk. Like I am a girl's girl through and through. Like I love to sit there and just, and just talk girl stuff, not mom stuff. I don't like talking mom stuff. (laughs) I don't want to talk about diapers or talking about the room class problems. I don't freaking care about that. I like talking about just like, I got my hair blown out and, oh, I like this size bra, you know, or, you know, I like that, not that size bra. Oh my gosh. You know, what surgery did you get done? I like that kind of stuff. (laughs) That conversation only happens in Newport beach. (laughs) Oh my gosh. Um, it's weekly. Yeah. (laughs) Whatever. Not me. Just kidding. No. Well, just to a lot of people in Newport Beach, that's probably weekly. So that was it. Mm-hmm. You like girl stuff. Yeah. yeah, you do. You do. You weren't always like that, though. You haven't always been like a like a girl friendship. I've always had a very hard time having girlfriends. Yeah. I mean, forever. Yeah. You know, but I think that's like in Bakersfield, I had one best friend. Yeah, Melissa. <laughs> And then all my other friends lived in different states. Yep. You know, so like here, but I was also very intentional about finding Mm -hmm. people. You've gotten a lot better at that. We moved here and loving just getting to know people and not judging people. I feel like is really helpful Mm because I was just super judgmental of people before. Yeah. You've definitely gotten a lot better at that, especially after we moved. It's funny because that's like, I used to be that person. And I guess I still am. I still like really value friendships and relationships and stuff. But you, when we moved here, for sure, you got like super intentional about getting out and making good friendships. Mm -hmm. So I'm proud of you for that because I know that I've been telling you that you need that in your life for the last 12 years. (laughs) You're finally doing it. Thank you. Yeah. Um. 
what is your favorite book that you're reading right now and why? Um, it's called the ABCs of real estate and investing. And I have it right here. Let me show you what it is. I will. So I've been reading that on audible and then I went a little bit crazy today and bought, I don't know. I probably spent like $300. This is the one I just bought multifamily millions. What is it called? Multifamily millions. Oh crap. Something like that. How to invest in apartments. That's what it, it was. Something like that. It's coming. You guys are about to hear so much stuff. So like, I think this is funny. Cause like one of me and I have like different girlfriends for like different topics. Right. So I have one girlfriend, Jenny, who we talk about, we're just like huge on investing. Like we're constantly talking to each other about, okay, what about this? What about this? And she'll send me like, uh, she's probably listening. Hi. And today she sent me like this property in Laguna beach. She wants to invest in. I was like, Oh my God, we'd have to gut that whole thing. And so we're just like talking to each other about how we can do this. And so it's speaking of girl time, it's really fun. So that's like my new thing. Even though we've invested before, like I want to like freaking take over the world after having Elena Cardone on the podcast. I was like, I'm all about that life. Like, and the fact that you can raise money to come up with the capital to buy things that you don't necessarily have the cash all to do yourself, mm-hmm. you know, to buy like multi million dollar deals. So that gets me excited. So that's what I'm, I like to do things that like, I like to constantly educate myself on things I don't know, you know, like reading Elon Musk biography or like the shoe dog book, you know, about Nike. Like I just like to learn things I don't know. I don't like to read self-help books. They all say the same thing. Think nice things. I'm like, okay, I get it. (laughs) Yep. I'm in. Let's do it. (laughs) I like that real estate investing. It's good. More passive income and streams of income. So another question, what do you do when you are having a bad day and literally you just can't seem to pull yourself out of it? Yell chase. (laughs) (laughs) You know, that's like my pet peeve. My, I can't like, it is nails on the chalkboard when she screams my name across the house. Like I can't even handle it. How often do I do that? Um, Multiple times a day, multiple, (laughs) especially the worst we were getting off the topic of this question, but I just want to like put this out there to the universe. (laughs) The worst is when literally I, she has to have some sort of like sixth sense or something because it, it, legit when my head hits the pillow and I like, you know, when you like get into cold sheets and your head hits the pillow and you're just like getting comfortable. And then she asked me to get up and get her water downstairs or something like that. Somehow I, I'm, I'm prompted to get out of that comfortable spot. <laughs> I don't know why you just don't, you need to just have the heating pad on me, bring the water to bed and just have all those things ready. Cause I feel like I'm asking for those all the time. My night mask. I, I sound like a prima donna right now. Those I, things change. Cause right now it's peppermint tea. You're asking me to get you peppermint tea all the time. That's a new one. That's so I, so I'm like, it's, it's a game of chess. I make one move and then you change it up on me. And then you want to make me <laughs> make another move. Okay. So now I have a question for you because I think some people listening in right now are like, Oh my gosh, my husband would never do that. They're doing that for their husbands. So how does that, I mean, I just, how does that make you feel that I do that? I have, have I always been like that? Hmm. Yeah, I kind of, I get, I mean, I don't know. I do, I do. I love you. So I want to do those things for you. Well, I just think about the time we were dating and remember I was having like all those colon issues Mm -hmm. and you went to the store and bought me mag citrate, which if you guys have never taken mag citrate, it's a laxative. (laughs) Yeah. Well, so I guess it started early then. I feel like I was always this way. Yeah. I think I just, I, it's so funny because I'm like super independent. Like I love like doing my own thing, like doing my, like having my life, you know, and like being a boss babe and all those things or whatever you call it. But I love to be spoiled by you. Yep. Like I have to be. If I'm not being spoiled by you, like I'm not happy. Yep. You're the most independent, dependent person I've ever met. <laughs> but that's what I, that's why I like to do those things because 
because you are so in, so independent, a lot of times I don't feel needed. And so, yeah, I just, I like to do those things for you because it makes me feel like you, like I'm needed, you know, and that makes me feel good. <laughs> yeah. oh, I love you. <laughs> you are needed. I couldn't even do any of this life without you. No, I know. You know what I mean? Like you're, I know, but I feel like some people, because we're constantly in like, we're like during the day we're in business mode, you know what I mean? And like, you're independent. I, I'm doing my job. You're doing your job. We're kind of like, you know, and so when we turn that off, I like to, you're my queen. I like to take care of you. So I left you half of a salad in the fridge tonight. <laughs> I ate half of it and then I left the other half of it in there for you. <laughs> it's the little things folks. It's the little things. <laughs> oh my god. What gosh. was the question? I don't remember the question. Oh, what do you do when you, <laughs> Oh, when I have a, day? that's right. Okay. So I yell chase. Okay. That's first thing. And then the second thing is I always like ask myself why, um, like, you know, what is going on in my life right now? So put up the mirror. Anytime you're having a bad day, look at yourself in the mirror. What is going on? Why am I feeling this way? And usually every time that I'm having a bad day, it's because I'm not filling up my soul. I'm just going, 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 giving, giving, giving to so many people and forgetting about myself. And so I like, I will like cancel my day. Like I don't have a problem doing that because I know I'm more efficient when I'm filled up. And so I don't do that often at all. I mean, it's very, very rare that I will do that. But I mean, when I do do that, I, I, I have to, I have to honor myself. And so I'll sit with myself and I like to journal. I like to, I listen to a lot of like Louise Hay meditations when I'm feeling in a funk and just remind myself that I am safe. Cause anytime I'm in a funk, it's, it's because I feel uncertain about my life and I feel scared and little Kayla wants to take over driving the bus. And I have to remind her that she can't, that 31 year old Kayla is in charge. And so I just sit with her for a little bit and make sure that she feels safe and secure and loved. And then I go on with my day. But uh, if those of you guys that don't know that, I mean, back, oh my gosh, I can't remember what episode it is, but it's one of the first 10 episodes I have is, you know, Dr. Jen Chrisman's on and she's talking about the analogy of the bus and how, you know, there's different versions of us um, at different ages. And those people, those former versions of ourselves never leave our bodies. They're always in our minds. They're always with us. And when we get triggered, sometimes they want to take over and we have to remind them that they don't get to take over, but we just need to, when they do that, it's just because they need love. And so I spend a lot of time doing that. Kind of answered my next question. Cause I was going to ask you how you deal with triggers. <laughs> this is cute. I'm, I'm so, you're so cute. Uh, so you're my trigger actually. Yeah, I know. That's why I'm asking the question. <laughs> <laughs> Why do you trigger me? You know, okay, so actually I think this is a good story because I feel like they've heard me talk a lot about like our marriage issues and stuff. <laughs> oh, really? When? No. <laughs> <laughs> do you not listen to the podcast? Um, of course I do. Oh my gosh, he doesn't listen. Well, so, well, I, I wouldn't say like off, like not like current ones. Like I don't be like, oh, we, we just got in a fight or anything like that. But like really about how when we fought a lot when I was first building my business. Mm -hmm. And so for those of you guys, this might be your first time listening in, which whoo, I love you if you're still listening. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, you know, just like how it was really hard. Like you were mean to me, like you were mean to me. So I, I would like for you to just share some of the things you used to say to me um, because it didn't come from a mean place. He wasn't a malicious person. He was just had an ego, right? And so just tell him, I mean, okay, so here's one thing. And I can say it because he's standing right here in front of me. But because some of you guys might have spouses that have said this to you, especially if you're in network marketing. But Chase used to call me, gosh, you're such a liar. How could you tell that person they're going to be successful when you know they're not going to be? And I was like, Chase, like, I think they could be. If they do X, Y, and Z, then they will be. And he's like, yeah, but you know they're not going to do that. And I was like, I don't know that. I have to treat everybody like they will do that. Like I want to give everybody hope because I know that this vehicle works for everybody that puts in the work and that decides to change, you know? And so I never felt like that. And he looked at it like from the outside looking in, like, oh my gosh, like she's, she's casting a vision for all these people to feel bad about themselves because they're never going to be able to live up to this version that she cast it for them. And so anyways, hearing that so often, it really like made me upset with you, made me angry, but you can, I guess you should probably explain why you did that. 
Um, I, I mean, mean I think was, I think this was like six years ago. Yeah, I mean, obviously, you know, I had a lot of personal growth issues, you know, a lot of personal growth that I needed to do. Um, and I think I was insecure in myself and had a big ego. And so, you know, hurt people, hurt people, right? Like I had a lot of insecurities that I had to deal with, um, to get me to see the other side. And, you know, now I know that that hope that you were giving could be the first hope that anybody's ever had in them, you know, and that's what could, could launch them on a new trajectory because they, nobody's ever believed in them. Nobody's ever given them hope or had hope in them. And so, you know, I just, it's just a different, different outlook now. Oh, that just made me cry. Cause it's, it's crazy to hear like, that's how you think about it. Now. Cause that's all I thought all along, yeah. but it took him so long to realize that. And I think, um, you know, that's what, that's why I get triggered though, is because when you criticize me about the way that I would coach people and sometimes now you will like, it's not, you're not doing it in a mean way, but you'll criticize me and going like, Hey, you know, when you talk to the, you know, when you talk to our employee, you need to say it like this, like you can't. And so when you, when you criticize me, it triggers me. Like, I'm like, I like go into this, like, kind of like back into where it was six years ago where I'm like, I'm a horrible person. Constructive. You still think that it's negative because Mm -hmm. that's the lens that you see it through. Right. So it's constantly like, I'm constantly doing work and basically trying to like hypnotize myself to think something different about that. And it actually welcome more criticism into my life. So that way, the more I hear it, the more I'm accepting and welcoming of it. Um, but really, I mean, anybody else can criticize me. It's really you <laughs> that triggers me, but That's why I asked the question. yeah, I mean, yeah. And I'm just being honest with you guys because you could be at home and be with the one that you cannot get away from. I mean, you're with them and you're just constantly being triggered. And how do you stay in a high vibe place, you know, and, and they're not, it's all, it all has to do with you. It's not even them. It's never about them. It's always about you and putting the mirror up to yourself. Why does this bother me? You know, and it always comes back to self-worth for me. Like, oh, when he criticizes me, it makes me feel like nothing. Okay, is that true that you're nothing? No. Okay, what is true about yourself? Like God says in the Bible to fill your minds with, with things that are true and righteous and of him. And so I always think that like anything else, it's the devil coming in and just trying to attack our marriage. And so I have to constantly remind myself of that. And you know what I mean? So, yeah, I liked that question. Yeah. So I think the last question, what is one thing that none of your audience in Probably most people don't know about you, but you want people to know about you. Oh, that's stumping me right now because I really feel like I'm an open book. I really do. I think actually, I mean, I think the one thing that people don't know is um, that I still really struggle with my dad, you know, my real dad. And um Cause I think I, t- I talk about the story so much just cause in the media and the press and stuff like that. And it's what gets people's attention. And it's actually what, what helps me most relate with normal people, with normal people, <laughs> like most people have their dads in jail when they're growing up, but you know, to have my dad still be struggling all these years later, I mean, he's in his sixties now is still, it's kind of hard for me to talk about to people because I still I want to like, I want to revert back to 16 year old Kayla. That's like going and trying to find him in drug houses and take care of him. And I've had to remove myself from that version of me so long ago, because it was like, if I stayed her, I would have lost my mind. You know what I mean? And so like, but it's like, you still, I still have this heart. Like I still want to help him and I can't, I literally had to remove myself from the situation completely because for my mental health. And I think I I don't know. I feel like a lot of people don't realize that it's, it's still like a really big struggle for me. People don't get to see that side of you all the time, you know, cause you're like this, uh, like take no crap from anybody boss, babe, you know? So it's good. Like that people see that you're human and that you still 
Like, even though those are, those are areas in your life that you have a handle on, like you don't let it control you, but it's, you still, <clears throat> you still struggle with it, you know? Yeah. I mean, for sure. It's, I think it's like, Oh, I, I see like other people with their dads. I'm like, Oh my God. Like, you know, I don't have that. That's why it's so important that we create the life for our kids that, you know, Oh my gosh. I know. Like I see Charlie with, with you and I'm just like, Oh my gosh, thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Because she's going to have such a different life. You know what I mean? Like she just has that like security and like, she's not like scared of, you know, like anything really. I feel like because she feels secure and she's not going to have the daddy issues, you know, like so many people struggle with daddy issues. And (laughs) I mean, I shouldn't laugh about that. I think that was my nervous laughter coming out right there. But, um, you know, like that's a, it's a, it's a real, real thing, especially when, um, it's something that not, can't necessarily heal that you won't ever actually get closure over. Cause it's like, he's, he's probably never going to be a sober person, Mm. you know? Yeah. That's why it's so, it's so important for us that we create stability for our family, you know, and because of that. So I'm That's proud what of we're you doing. for sharing that. Oh, I love you. Did you know I was going to say that? No, I didn't. What did you think I, I was going to say? I thought you were going to go funny with it, but you like <laughs> totally changed the, like s- turned the Titanic on us. On, on. <laughs> I feel like I do that. I just like to yeah. drop the bomb. It's good though. Cause it's real. It's vulnerable. Yeah. Know? But I don't want to leave the listeners on, no. on that because right. it's kind of like this. Like, Ooh, gosh, that sucks. That that's, that that's heavy. very heavy. But I think people like, are probably crying. I know people are, cause I just got done crying. I yeah. just wiped my eyes. But I think one thing that you guys should know is like, if you guys, um, you know, are struggling with that same thing, maybe it is a family member that you haven't had closure with, or, you know, anybody that's dealing with an addict, it's, it's hard. It's hard. And, um, the number one thing is, is to always remember that they're a mirror for you. They are a mirror for you and to constantly pray for them and send them love from afar. But you have got to set boundaries. You have got to set boundaries and stick to them because otherwise your mental health is like, it'll, it'll be no good. You know what I mean? So it's just like learning how to implement boundaries. Like, so I just have a massive amount of boundaries. And like, my rule is like, if you're not sober, you can't talk to me. And so that's, that's my boundary. And I'm not willing to cross it no matter what, because I have three kids that I have to like keep, (laughs) keep, be normal for, you know what I mean? So, um, I think for any of you guys listening, and if you've had trouble with setting boundaries, um, you know, you get what you tolerate in life. Yep. So it's like, I kept, I would enable his bad behavior all the time. And I kept getting the same behavior and I'm like, gosh, I'm doing everything for him. I'm giving him all this money. Why won't he stop? And it's because I was enabling him, you know, and, and it's the same way. If you're in a bad relationship with somebody, you and en- you enable bad behavior by allowing it to continue to happen. Yep. So the moment you draw a line in the sand, you say no more. Like we're not crossing this line. If you do, it's done. Then you start to get different outcomes and it feels good when you start to get different outcomes because you start to feel differently about things and you'll realize, okay, like I need to set high standards for my life and accept nothing else. And that's all I've learned. Like from this whole thing is that like the number one person I need to be receiving love from is myself. Yeah. Right. And, and then God, like, you know, and God is within me. So if I'm connected to him at all times, like, you know, then I'm not going to struggle with that relationship with my, my earthly father, you know, but. Yeah, that's good. Mic drop. (laughs) All right, you guys. So we're going to end this on a funny note and I'm going to ask Chase one last question. Okay. Oh, you're asking me a question now. I want to ask you one question. Okay. Okay. But it's going to be a funny. (sighs) All right. It's going to be a funny. Okay. If you had $5 million in the bank right now, how would you spend it? Strip club. (laughs) Are you kidding me? You're disgusting. You would never do that in your whole life. He's never been to one in his whole life, you guys. (laughs) Oh, gosh. (laughs) I just had to do it. You said we need to end on a funny note. I thought that was like like the twist, you know? Um, $5 million. If I had $5 million in the bank right now, what would I do? Oh, um, I would probably buy a sweet car. 
because I've been wanting to buy and a lot. You got to give 10% away, first of all. That's how you start it out. Oh, well, yeah. Okay, there you go. <laughs> so I'd give, yeah, I, I was getting to that, though. Oh, okay. But yeah, you, you jacked my mojo up here. So I was going to get a car. Um, and because I've been wanting, I want, I've been wanting like a third vehicle, you know, I have my, I have my big truck and you know, we have the, the G wagon, but I want like a, I want like a, every time we get a small car, it lasts for about two months and then well, he's over it. Well, you know, every time, you every know, time. but let's not, let's not judge the past and let's go for the future here. <laughs> we're, we're looking future. Um, and then I would buy some income properties I would give more than 10%. I don't know how much I would give, but I would give money to um, a mission, our missions organization that we partner with called Radius International. Um, yeah. And then I would just invest like crazy because the money does no good sitting in the bank. So I want to make my money work for me. I'm going to go invest it in income properties. I'm going to invest it in companies, startups, tech. I love, I love investing in, um, startup businesses. Yeah. Make it work. Yay. Okay. Turn that 5 million into 500 million. That's what I'm about. That's right. Boo boo. All right, you guys. So I, the reason why I asked Chase that question is because I wanted to make sure he was on top of his game right there. And I want to make sure all of you guys are on top of your game. So if you don't know the answer to that question, what would you do if you had $5 million in the bank right now? You know what? You might never have the $5 million in the bank right now if you don't know what you would do with it. So I want you to do that exercise when you get done with this podcast. What would you do? Dream big, have fun with it and get that vibrationally high energy of what it feels like to have that much money, put it out into the universe and spread it all around and see what good you can do with it. I love you guys so much. I hope you guys enjoyed this episode. If you did, take a screenshot, share it, tag me and Chase on Instagram and we'll repost it. And remember, I'm giving away a pair of Lorna Jane pants every single week to people that leave a review. So if you haven't done that yet, head over there and leave us one. We love you guys. Bye. See ya. Thank you for listening to the Mommy Millionaire Podcast. For free resources and materials, head over to mommymillionaire.co. Make sure to follow Mommy Millionaire on Spotify and subscribe on iTunes. And it would mean the world to me if you left a five-star review of the show. And as always, ladies, go out there and get what you want.